When it comes to Nickelodeon, most people view SpongeBob SquarePants as the most important show that was ever on the network. Now, there's actually some truth to that. But before there was SpongeBob, there was another show that carried that mantle. A cartoon that would break ground for Nickelodeon and gave them a big push as a network for animated content. Rugrats One of the most successful shows from the 1990s. It was a primetime juggernaut that was super popular with both kids and adults. It made millions of dollars in merchandise and was the third longest running Nick show right behind SpongeBob and the Fairly Odd Parents. This pop culture icon was a big hit on the network, and it can be argued that Rugrats paved the way for the future of Nicktoons. But despite its massive levels of success, it all came crumbling down. By the early 2000s, the franchise had run out of steam and was put to rest in 2004. Why was that? How did such a popular show that was the pride of Nickelodeon die out? It's a question that I never really even asked myself. I mean, I grew up with this show. I was the main demographic it was targeting, and I watched its rise, peak, and downfall. But I never questioned why it happened. Well, the answer is very surprising. Many people assume it was the later seasons and the introduction of new characters that led to a drop in quality, and there's some truth to that. But the main reasons actually lie with an internal conflict. The people who made Rugrats did not get along with one another, and the level of drama and tension between these creators even led to a legal dispute. Angelica, what's going on here? I'm suing you. There's a lot more to the story than you think, so we're going to take a closer look at what ruined Rugrats. Our story begins in the early 1990s with Nickelodeon. Around this time, the network was under the command of Geraldine LeBourne. She and her team had a vision for Nick to make it the first children's network. Part of this plan was introducing original animated shows that stood out from the typical Saturday lineup. Cartoons that were creator-driven and did not just exist to sell toys. Many pilots were created and pitched to Nickelodeon but only three would go on to be Nicktoons, Doug, Ren Stimpy, and Rugrats. The concept for the show was pretty simple. It's about babies who would talk whenever parents would leave the room. They would go on adventures, and the audience could see the world through the eyes of an infant. There were three people who were primarily responsible for the creation of Rugrats. Arlene Klasky, Gaber Supo, whose first name I'm pretty sure I'm saying wrong. It's Hungarian, and I think I'm saying it incorrectly. We'll just call him Supo from this point on. And last but not least, Paul Germain. Klasky and Supo were actually married around the time, and founded an animation studio called Klasky Supo. It would go on to create quite a few shows for Nick, such as Rocket Power, Ah Real Monsters, As Told by Ginger, and The Wild Thornberries but it was Rugrats that would put them on the map. Now, this wasn't the first time that these three had worked together. A few years prior, this trio helped to produce the Simpsons shorts from the Tracy Ullman show. They even stayed on for the first three seasons of the official Simpsons. But Rugrats would be their show, and it was Klasky herself who came up with it. She was pregnant around this time, so the concept of the show was something that was personal to her. What about a show about babies? That was her idea, and she passed it off to Paul Germain, who refined it. Now, remember this guy's name. It's going to be a big part of the story as we move on. But Nickelodeon loved the concept. They signed them up and contracted the studio to create 65 episodes. There was Tommy Pickles, the brave and adventurous main character. His friends, Phil and Lil, the twins who delivered on that gross-out humor. Chucky the nervous wreck who was always afraid of everything, and then the queen of mean herself, Angelica, Tommy's cousin who was always bullying the babies. There were also a bunch of side characters. Real talk, Stu is my spirit animal. What are you doing? Making chocolate pudding. It's four o'clock in the morning. Why on earth are you making chocolate pudding? Because I've lost control of my life. The show had a talented staff of writers. That even included the future creator of Hey Arnold, Craig Bartlett. The team did their job and delivered on the 65 episodes. 
and the studio ceased production. On Sunday morning, August 11th, 1991, Rugrats made its debut to the world. Now, at first, Ren and Stimpy were the talk of the town, but Rugrats performed modestly and would even go on to win a daytime Emmy for Outstanding Animated Program. But a change was made that would make Rugrats an overnight sensation. Herb Scannell, whose name I'm probably saying wrong too, was in charge of programming at Nick, and he made the decision to broadcast Rugrats every day in the evening time. This was a prime time slot, and it made all the difference. This decision was key and unlocked the popularity of Rugrats, and having 65 episodes allowed Nickelodeon to air reruns and have a different episode air every day for two months. Rugrats was like the Teen Titans Go of its time, and the ratings went through the roof. Due to its success, Nickelodeon approached Klasky and Supo and asked them to create more episodes, and their answer was yes. Wait a second, Klasky, Supo, where's Paul? Hmm. The Rugrats franchise would grow and grow and grow. There were movies, merchandise, parade floats, and even spin-offs. The show even broke ground with an episode about Passover, which was a first for children animation. Wow, now I've seen everything. Nickelodeon had finally found its big hit and a show to represent the network. Klasky and Supo were also flying high, and they were the main look of Nickelodeon during the 90s. But Rugrats' success was not going to last forever. And funny enough, it was events that happened before its success that would lead to its eventual downfall. Rugrats was Nickelodeon's juggernaut during the 90s, but its popularity began to decline around the late 90s and early 2000s. So why did this happen? What caused the fall of Rugrats? A lot of people believe it has something to do with the introduction of new characters, such as Tommy's brother Dill, or Chucky's stepsister, Kimmy. And there's actually some truth to that. There was a shift in the overall tone of the show, but the reason why that happened was due to fighting between the show creators and the writing staff, primarily Arlene Klasky and Paul Germain. Remember how I told you all to remember this guy's name? Well, here's why. Klasky and Paul did not see eye to eye when it came to Rugrats. Klasky, for example, was in favor of the babies acting more like children and was on the record saying that certain episodes had them being too adult, such as The Trial. To her, this was a show about babies, so they should consistently act like babies. There are even rumors that Klasky was so obsessed with the characters that she herself would mimic their baby talk while talking to other writers. Have fun with Grandpa Tommy. Paul, on the other hand, was in favor of doing, according to him, intelligent stories for intelligent children. To be the Simpsons of kids shows that was plot driven and featured well-developed characters. And one character in particular became the main battleground between Klasky and Germain and can be attributed as the main reason why the show fell apart. Yep, Little Miss Sass herself. Klasky hated Angelica, and she's on the record saying this. The character was never part of her original creation and was instead introduced by Paul. He thought that having an antagonist in the series would help it out and was even inspired by Paul from some bully from his childhood. But to Klasky, all she saw was a bully, someone who was cruel to the innocent babies. There was one episode in particular that rubbed Klasky the wrong way, and it was called Barbecue Story. In it, Angelica throws Tommy's ball over the fence, and Klasky complained, saying, quote, how would I feel if my kids were watching that? There was also beef with Angelica saying, you dumb babies, and how both Klasky and the network didn't like that, but they ultimately gave up on fighting it. Dumb babies. Paul and the writing staff didn't see Angelica as just a bully, and instead wanted to explore why she acts out, to show the viewers the reasons why Angelica is the way she is. 
According to my sources, Supo often acted as the mediator between his wife Klasky and Paul and the writing staff. From the looks of it, he ultimately favored good writing, so Paul and his team usually got it their way. And this part's crazy to me. The writing staff even took shots at Klasky and her parenting style. In the show, Tommy's mom Dee Dee is obsessed with this guy named Dr. Lipschitz. He's some kind of baby psychologist who's a professional and has all the information of how to raise a kid the right way. Well, guess who also was a big fan of those kinds of doctors? Yep. Lipschitz knows more about being a mommy than anyone in the world. Chucky, ever since I was little, I always heard my mommy say, the Lipschitz says this, or the Lipschitz says that, and I never knew what the Lipschitz was. Klasky and Supo actually got divorced in 1995, though they claim it's due to private reasons, and not the show itself. They continue to work professionally, but it does make you wonder if Supo's decision to back Jermaine was one of the reasons behind the divorce. Guess we'll never know. But in 1993, the team accomplished their goal. 65 episodes. After that, Paul quit and left the studio, taking with him the majority of the writers too. There was even a legal dispute that ended with a settlement and how they all agreed that Klasky and Supo can't discuss or share why the team left. They straight up took their animosity to court. I strongly advise you to settle this matter out of court. A settlement? He's right, Charlotte. Let's just end this thing as painlessly as possible. But despite the turbulent tension around this time, magic was about to happen for Rugrats. Due to the programming changes made to the schedule, Rugrats exploded overnight. It became one of the most popular shows on television, with millions of viewers per week. And after a two-year break, the show went back into production, but this time without Paul and the other writers. Klasky and Supo earned a lot of praise around this time and claimed to be the creative geniuses behind the success of the show, effectively leaving Paul's name out of the picture. Now, Paul was able to land on his feet and went on to work for Disney. There, he created Recess and Lloyd in Space. A new writing staff was brought in to continue the production on Rugrats, but it did not have the same edge or charm as the original team. Despite that, it went on for nine seasons and ran until August of 2004. But it was plain to see that the magic was missing, and that was a big reason why Rugrats came to an end. No, that's not to say it didn't have its moments, but there was a notable decline that only continued to get worse as time went on. And finally, as if a nail in the coffin, a certain yellow sponge arrived and took the world by storm. I'm ready! I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. SpongeBob became the next big thing in the early 2000s and was even bigger than Rugrats. Also, and this is just me speculating, but it's possible that the kids who initially watched Rugrats outgrew it and saw it as something for babies. Ironic. At the end of the day, the thing that ruined Rugrats was a writing staff that couldn't see eye to eye with the show creators. Klasky was firmly grounded with what she believed was the best for the show, despite the suggestions from Paul Germain and the rest of the writing staff. It was a power struggle that ultimately led to Rugrats' demise. But what I find so fascinating about this, though, is that the thing that led to the success of Rugrats was ruined before the show even became popular. It's such a bizarre situation, cause usually it's franchise fatigue, or network meddling, or jumping the shark that usually ruins the popularity of a series. But for Rugrats, it was losing Paul Germain and the writing staff. It lost what made it successful before it was even successful. I guess one could say that the show was killed in the crib, Despite the decline in the series, Nickelodeon owes a debt of gratitude to Rugrats. It was a cultural phenomenon and was a big stepping stone for Nick. Their objective back then was to find creator-driven series that could allow the network to stand out from the competition, and Rugrats delivered. It was truly unique and one of a kind. And funny enough, these babies are supposed to make a comeback in 2021. According to Nickelodeon's Instagram account and this Variety article, there's a movie in the works 
and a TV series to follow. But something about this confuses me. According to the IMDb page and this article, Klasky, Supo, and Jermaine are going to return as executive producers to work on the revivals. Now, nothing has been 100% confirmed, and this could just be an error. And truth be told, with all of the drama and bad blood from the 90s, it would be very surprising to see Klasky and Jermaine working together again. Uh, maybe they buried the hatchet and are talking once more. Or maybe Nickelodeon is paying them a stupid amount of money, and that's good enough. Uh, there's really no way of knowing until we get an official confirmation. Regardless of the situation, we're going to be seeing Rugrats return both on the big screen and on the television. Will it be just as successful as it once was almost 30 years ago? Well, only time will tell. Oh no. Hey guys, Saber here, and just wanted to thank you all for watching this video. If you liked it, give it a like, and post a comment down below. Also, a big shout out to my friend Jim, who helped me to write and research this video. He also does a bunch of movies and cartoon reviews, so go check him out. Alright, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.